Good morning. I'm Dega McDowell in from Maria Bartiromo. It's Tuesday, July 31st. Your top story is at 7 a.m. Eastern. Earnings driving the action on Wall Street. Three Dow components reporting today. Pfizer up first. The pharmaceutical giant posting better than expected results. It raised its full year profit guidance, but it did slash its revenue outlook. You can take a look at stock trends and water right here, right now. The big one to watch, Apple. It reports after the close. We have a preview plus a closer look at the tech wreck. Key stocks entering correction territory. That's a loss of 10% or more from those June record highs. Taking the market action across the board, the Dow futures are improving. 44 point gain on the Dow futures to wrap up the month of July. This after declines across the board yesterday. The NASDAQ hardest hit yesterday down one more than one and one third percent. We have gains right now. And despite the recent weakness, we do have a tendency to focus on the short term. And it has been rough in some of these big name technology stocks like Facebook and Twitter. But all of your major market gauges from the Dow down to the Dow Transports and the Russell 2000 Small Cap Index, they are all on track for monthly gains. The Dow Transports are up almost 6% in July. In Europe, let's take a look at England, France, and Germany. A reading on the Eurozone economy showed slowing growth in the second quarter, but all of those markets there are managing to eke out a gain. Before we move on, we've got Procter & Gamble reporting earnings right here, right now. If you're watching on the television, you can look at the bottom of your screen, but we've got 94 cents a share. That's four cents above the estimate of 90 cents a share. That's for people listening on the radio. $16.5 billion in revenue. It's a slight miss on the revenue side, on the top line. In Asia overnight, the markets there already closed, but it was gains across the board except for half of 1% loss on the Hang Seng. The Bank of Japan surprising investors by keeping its monetary policy unchanged. And then moving out west, devastation in Northern California, wildfires raging, burning more than 100,000 acres, and the fire so hot it's creating its own weather system. How the U.S. military is now joining the fight. That's ahead. Plus another health scare for Chipotle. One restaurant closing after several diners reportedly got sick. And that stock under pressure this morning. And millennial money, a new survey shows where the generation is investing and the results might surprise you. All that and so much more coming up this morning. Fox News contributor Kat Temp is here. She's going to weigh in on that. <laughs> Wall Street Journal Global Economics Editor John Hills and Rath and CFRA Investment Strategist Lindsay Bell. Real quick, how do you invest your money, Kat Temp? You pay somebody who knows what they're talking about to invest it for you. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's much. what I do. Or we have some other alternatives. <laughs> that's mighty trusting you. Yeah, yes, put it, it is. in somebody else's hands. Or know. your, you know, index funds, cat index funds. We'll talk in the break. Thank you, guys. we got so much to talk about to our top story this hour. President Trump traveling to Tampa today to host a rally to talk jobs, economy, and a show of force for Congressman Ron DeSantis. President Trump's visit comes ahead of a competitive primary race. DeSantis faces against Agriculture Commissioner Adam Putnam for Florida governor for the Republican nomination for governor. Trump's support has had a major impact on the polls. The latest numbers show DeSantis making one major comeback, now up 11 percentage points ahead of the primary election amid next month amid President Trump's endorsement. The congressman releasing a campaign ad in his race for governor that is going viral and it's full of a lot of love for the president. Watch this. Everyone knows my husband, Ron DeSantis, is endorsed by President Trump, but he's also an amazing dad. Ron loves playing with the kids. Build the wall. He reads stories. Then Mr. Trump said, you're fired. I love that part. He's teaching Madison to talk. Make America great again. People say Ron's all Trump, but he is so much more. Big league. So good. I just thought you should know. Ron DeSantis for governor.
Joining me now, the Florida Congressman himself, Ron DeSantis, a member of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Congressman, that has sent people who dislike President Trump, I don't care what party affiliation they have, into a frenzy. They are losing their minds about that. But do you risk anything of really going full in on President Trump, although his, his endorsement of you has been a, a, a great benefit to you and your campaign and the polls and even in fundraising? Well, Dagan, I mean, you know, in some of these things uh, with the political back and forth, you got to be able to take a step back and just kind of laugh at the situation, have a little fun with it. Um, and so that's what we were trying to do. Um, it is a way to introduce voters to, to my wife, who's my best friend and best supporter, and our, and our kids, because that's an important part of who I am. Obviously, we've run ads previous to this, talking about my military service, talking about my conservative credentials. But when you have nonstop ads in a primary season, you know, I think it's good to just kind of take a step back back, uh, be able to laugh at yourself a little bit, um, and have a little fun with it. Well, Congressman, the joke has always been that politicians go on the campaign trail and hold babies, but you're using a baby, you're your son, in that ad to maybe um, make people feel good, no? Well, look, our, our, everyone has said, you know, wow, your, your, your wife's beautiful, your kids are so cute and everything, and, and they are. I mean, I'm very, very proud of my family. We love to get them out on the campaign trail as much as possible. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world when your daughter's 20 months because she's very active. My sons pretty much go with the flow, so that's a little bit easier. But uh, they're just a really, really central part of my life, and I wanted to let voters uh, get an introduction to them. Congressman, do you disagree with President Trump on any policy ideas? Can you name one? I don't agree with anybody on everything 100% of the time. What I've typically done, though, with the president is, is talk to him privately rather than go kowtow. I mean, the easiest way to get a microphone in your face in Washington is to bash the president. If you're a Republican for CNN and NBC and, and New York Times, I don't think that's constructive. Um, but there are obviously things that, 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 I've, that I have disagreed. But you do it constructively, and you try to, um, you try to move the ball forward as best you can. Do you care to mention any of those things you've <laughs> had constructive conversations well, well, Dagan, with? <laughs> One of them that you, we would probably agree with is, you know, I'm not a fan of farm subsidies. And, you know, to throw billions of dollars in farm subsidies, I, I want to get away from doing that. Uh, you know, so there's just a, you know, it's just an honest disagreement. I have disagreed, you know, there's people in the Republican conference who we disagree with um, on those things. And so it's fine, but you, you agree with, um, you know, most of what's going on. Um, and you just try to press forward as best you can. Well, that $12 billion in farm subsidies is to offset any hit that say farmers, soybean farmers and the like would face because of the retaliatory tariffs from China as we've gotten into this uh, tariff fight, trade fight with China. Also the steel and aluminum tariffs play into some of the retaliation from allies like Canada. But do you agree with that approach? So trade is expected to play a big role in the GOP primary. China has threatened additional retaliatory tariffs against an array of agricultural products that would impact your state. So if you're against uh, farm subsidies, are you against what the president has done in terms of tariffs and the fight that we're beginning to wage with some trading partners? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I think I've been surprised at, at some of the success he's gotten. I've typically not been somebody uh, that, has, that has supported tariffs, and I don't think that's the end state that you want. Um, but I think he's leveraged that, like he did with the European Union, uh, to get concessions. And so if that's what he's able to do, then that's probably going to benefit a lot of folks. Um, if, if the concessions aren't there, then I think you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have to change course. Um, but using it to negotiate, it was not something that, that a lot of us had thought about previously. Uh, he really believes in doing it, and, and I think that he's been able to, to, to get some to get some concessions. So I think we'll see how it goes going forward. Because I was going to mention that Adam Putnam is the agriculture secretary in the state, so this will be an issue in terms of any ab impact on the agriculture sector in Florida. And critically important, it's one of the, the biggest pieces of the Florida economy. Are people calling your office as a congressman from the state and complaining about the fallout on them, whether they're farmers or not, about the trade fight that's just beginning this year? 
Not yet, not really. I mean, I think that there's some folks who are very supportive of, of doing it politically because they think this has gone on too long. There's other folks who are who are sub, who are concerned but want to give the president uh, some runway. Uh, so you know, we'll see how things mm -hmm. develop. But I would say, you know, Dagan, ag, ag has been a big part of Florida's economy. Obviously, tourism. I think the thing for the next governor is, you know, how do you expand the economic base? I think we're primed to do very well in financial services. Why would you start a hedge fund right now in Connecticut or New York, given that the SALT deduction is gone? We don't have income tax in Florida. We have a very good uh, regulatory climate positive. We've got to do some other things, but I think we're gonna, you're going to see Florida with the right policies really expand economic right. opportunities in a variety of industries, and that's exciting. Congressman, a brewing border battle. President Trump doubling down yesterday on his threat of a government shutdown for lack of border wall funding, saying he would, quote, certainly be willing to close down the government. One administration official now says, tells the Wall Street Journal, the president has agreed to delay that fight over border security until after November's midterm elections. Congressman, how critical is border protection and building that wall for Republican voters this fall? And would you stand by a shutdown? down if it happens before the midterms? Well, one, I think one of the disappointments in the Congress, fr frankly, is we still to this day have not really done much to push for the border wall. We did have the Goodlatte bill that got 193 mm -hmm. votes in the House, but this is one of the president's central promises. We should have moved this in January of 2017. Uh, so now at this stage, whether that's the right inflection point to do it, I don't know. But I will tell you this. Um, it will probably be harder to get all our voters out to the polls uh, in November uh, as a result of the Congress not following through. You know, many of us wanted to follow through with it, but we actually never got that across the finish line. And I think that, that uh, there's been a lot of good things done, but I think that is definitely something uh, that could bite some of our members in the behind. You mean if the border wall is not funded? Yeah, or to not even have fights over it. I mean, you know, it's one thing if we're really pushing forward, we're passing it in the House, it's in the Senate, they're debating it, voting on it, and then you have a couple of these Democrat senators in Trump states, if they're voting to filibuster it, then you take that issue to the voters, um, and you can see, you can try to make a change. But, you know, we haven't even been willing to have the fight yet, and I think that that frustrates a lot of folks. But would you get behind a shutdown if it meant shutting down the government in order to get that border um, funding, that wall funding? Well, that's, well, what the House would do is, I mean, we would either fund it or not. I mean, we would not be the ones, you know, that would, quote, shut down government. We would pass a funding bill, presumably, that has funding for the wall, and I would support the funding, and then it would go to the Senate, and the question would be, I think the president would say, make sure this is in there, otherwise I'm not going to sign it. Right. Um, and I think it'll be, it'll fall to those Democratic senators and see how they react. And you got to be nimble on these things. I mean, you got to have, um, you got to have political, you know, political sense to it. So we'd have to see how it goes out. But I think we should definitely put that in whatever funding mm -hmm. mechanism we send over uh, to the Senate. But I can tell you, if we do another omnibus bill mm -hmm. that's put together at the last minute and, and, and packed with spending and there's no border security, uh, that is going to be a bad thing for a Republican Congress to do. And President Trump, after he signed the last one, did reiterate that he would not sign another one unless it funded the border wall. Thank you, Congressman. Congressman Ron DeSantis. We'll be watching this evening as President Trump heads to Tampa. Thank you. Coming up, Chipotle taking another hit. Shares of the burrito chain sinking after one of its restaurants was shut down over reports of customers getting sick. Details on that, plus Chipotle's big giveaway today. Money in the bank, why millennials' preference for cash over stocks could be costing them big time. The earnings parade continues as investors look over results from Pfizer and some other big names. Cheryl Cassoni has the details. Cheryl? That's right, Dagan. Pfizer's uh, latest results came in better than expected as the company raises its profit outlook for the entire year. Uh, but Pfizer also cut the revenue outlook due to the stronger dollar. Pfizer shares were under pressure now in the pre-market, down a little more than three-quarters of a percent right now. Procter & Gamble just out with better than expected earnings per share, but revenue came in just short of expectations. 
says shares of P&G are lower ahead of the opening bell, down almost 2%. We are also watching this morning the FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple. Uh, Apple, of course, getting er earnings after the bell. Amazon, Netflix, and Google's parent Alphabet. The Nasdaq Composite closed down nearly 1.5% yesterday on growth concerns about the technology sector in general. That's as one closely watched index of the FANG stocks slid into correction ter territory Excuse me, uh, yesterday, the NICE FANG index. So we're watching a lot of these names in particular today. Also watching this for you, more trouble at Chipotle. The chain has shut down a restaurant in Ohio following reports of as many as 12 customers getting sick after they ate there. Some customers detailed their illness on the food safety website IWasPoisoned.com. Uh, Chipotle says that the, it is working now with local health officials to reopen the store as soon as possible. Well, a number of food safety issues since 2015, you may remember, have hurt the restaurant stock and obviously its reputation. Anyway, shares of Chipotle dropped about 1.5% yesterday. Uh, we should, of course, be watching the stock today. Also today, lighter note, it's free guacamole day at Chipotle, just in case you're wondering. They're celebrating National Avocado Day. They're not going to be charging extra for their very popular guacamole, uh, especially when you order it online with an entree. You have to type in the seven-digit code, avocado. Pretty simple. All right. A woman wants to take Canada Dry to court over ginger ale. She filed a lawsuit against Canada Dry and its parent company, Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, claiming that Canada Dry lies to its customers with the name ginger ale because it doesn't actually have any ginger in it. Woman says this is false advertising because Canada Dry promises consumers the health benefits of ginger. Similar lawsuits have previously been filed in Missouri, Massachusetts, California, and Texas. Bring on the lawyers, Dagan. Those are your headlines. Back to you. Thank you, Cheryl. Cat Temp's over here making a face. Imagine. She's making the same face. Again, this society, the people, what they sue over, it makes me crazy. Imagine taking time out of your life to sue a pop company. Period. Just imagine over I ginger ale doesn't have pop. ginger ale. Yeah, I'm from Michigan. Ginger <laughs> ale doesn't have ginger in it. Don't they have like friends and or even, you know, a show they like on Netflix to watch? Don't they have things to do? Thank you, Cat Temp. That's why I went to <laughs> coming up crossing party lines. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin becoming the first in his party to sit down with Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Why other Democrats could soon follow. In a touching moment amid the destruction, one little girl handing out burritos to firefighters battling the car fire in California. We've got more of this heartwarming video for you straight ahead. Paul Manafort heading to court. Jury selection beginning today for President Trump's former campaign chairman. If convicted, he could face decades in prison on bank and tax fraud charges. This is the first case arising from special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia probe. Joining us now, former federal prosecutor Andrew McCarthy. Andy, could this, how will this even trial have an impact on the course of Mueller's investigation? You know, it really won't have any. The more you think about it, the less I think it, it will. The thought up till now has been, and it's probably still true, that Mueller is trying to squeeze Manafort to see if he's got anything on Trump in connection with collusion. But if you think about it, Mueller has had Richard Gates as a witness for months. Mm -hmm. Gates was Manafort's partner through all of the shenanigans that he's on trial for, mm -hmm. right? You have to think, and, and plus Gates came into Trump's campaign with Manafort. So it'd be hard to believe that there's something that Manafort has about the campaign and any connection with Russia that Gates doesn't already have and was not already in a position to give to Mueller. So, you know, I think they went down this road with Manafort. Uh, all of the, the interesting thing is this may be a test of, of Mueller's prosecution, but it's not really a test of his investigation. The rationale for the investigation is any interference by Russia in the election and any connection that the Trump campaign may have had in that. This trial has nothing to do with that. And this is the first of two trials. There's Correct. another trial that's going to happen in uh, the District of Columbia. Right. And that one doesn't have anything to do with the rationale for the investigation either. The reason there's two trials is 
Manafort objected to being tried to, f for everything, including some tax charges that he's entitled to have in a, in a particular venue. Most people would want to have one trial where it all gets hammered out there. Mm -hmm. He decided to push for two. If you're Rudy Giuliani, though, would you wait until after all this is done to make a decision about allowing the president to potentially sit down for an interview, though? No, if I was Rudy, I wouldn't let the president sit down for an interview. <laughs> Thank you for that very short answer, Andy. <laughs> Switching gears to breaking party lines, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin meeting with Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh yesterday, becoming the first in his party to sit down with President Trump's pick for the high court. After the two met on Capitol Hill, the West Virginia senator described the meeting as productive. Vice President Mike Pence explained why the president chose Kavanaugh during his, that exclusive interview with Maria Bartiromo last week. For the president of the United States in this deliberation, he was looking for a judge of, with extraordinary credentials and intellect, but also a judge who would strictly interpret the Constitution as written and not legislate from the bench. Judge Brett Kavanaugh uh, has that judicial philosophy. He has a proven record. That's what the president made this nomination about. That's the message we'll carry to Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. Uh, and we remain confident uh, that, uh, that before the fall is out, that Judge Brett Kavanaugh will be Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Senator Joe Manchin, Heidi Heitkamp, and Joe Donnelly were the three Democrats who voted for Neil Gorsuch. Do you expect all of these three to get on board or even more? We heard from Rand Paul yesterday. He's a, a yay vote on yeah. Brett Kavanaugh to yeah. be on the court. Yeah, I do. I think that, um, in fact, the dynamic going on inside the Democratic Party now may actually draw more moderate Democrats toward Kavanaugh uh, because there's, I think, in the places where they're running, which are which are states that that Trump won, some places like Indiana, where he won by a lot, there's a lot of pressure on those Democrats to distinguish themselves from the sort of uh, flavor of the month that we have of the hard progressive left, particularly the woman who won in uh, in New York, uh, and I, I think that's going to push those people to to, to show that they're more reasonable and ready to work with there the other side. Ten Democratic senators up for re-election in Trump states right. come November. And again, if you if you vote against Brett Kavanaugh, you do appear as if you're taking orders from Chuck Schumer. Yeah, well, the problem they have is Kavanaugh is an excellent judge. If it wasn't for the, the infusion of politics in this, if it was just his craftsmanship, his ability as a lawyer, and his reputation in his life, this would be a no-brainer. It should be a hundred to nothing confirmation. Andrew McCarthy, great to see you. Thanks. Andy, be well. Come back soon. You're around now, so we see I you am all around. the time. Love it. <laughs> Coming up, living up to the Rocket Man nickname, North Korea is said to be pressing ahead with building new missiles, according to U.S. spy agencies. We have the details. Plus, taking the money, why millennials' preference for cash over stocks could be costing them millions. Welcome back. I'm Dega McDowell from Maria Bartiro. It's Tuesday, July 31st. Your top story is at 7.30 a.m. Eastern. Big names reporting earnings this week and especially today. Three Dow components out today. Procter & Gamble out with results a short while ago. Out with some mixed numbers. The Procter & Gamble beat on earnings but missed on the revenue. And that stock is down more than 2.5% right now. Pfizer beat expectations on the top and bottom line, but it did cut its revenue outlook. That stock is down by half of 1%. The big report out to watch, Apple this afternoon. Apple shares are moving up slightly in pre-market trading, one-third of 1%. 1 Will Apple's results, if they're good, give all tech stocks a lift? Because so far, that Facebook and Twitter have fallen out of bed big time. Some of these tech stocks, if you throw all the FANG stocks in, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, they're, they're in correction territory, down more than 10% from the record highs in June. Right now, we look at futures across the board gains, 26-point gain on the Dow futures, despite 
those moves lower on Procter and Gamble and Pfizer. The markets yesterday read across the board big losses on the Nasdaq composite yesterday, down more than one percent. In Europe right now, we've had some buying to report in England, France, and Germany. Germany stock market dipping lower at the moment. Asian markets finishing mostly in the green. The Hang Seng losing about half of one percent. New satellite images show North Korea might be making new missiles. This just weeks after the historic summit between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and President Trump. The P Department of Homeland Security creating a new cyber hub. It will guard the nation's banks, energy companies and other industries from cyber attacks. We'll discuss that with Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen in the next hour. Plus, the car fire in California has become the seventh most destructive in the state's history. I lost it all. Every bit of it. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> if you live in California, you need to be prepared. It's going to be a long, long summer. It's only July. The blaze has destroyed almost 1,000 structures with more than a dozen people missing. We have more details and how one little girl is trying to make a difference coming up. And with millennials taking hits from every generation lately, there's that video of that little girl handing out burritos. We'll show you more of that. So millennials, they, 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 can't, they can't catch a break from any other generation, but it might surprise you where they are investing their money. Is it smart? We debate. Now on to our top story this half hour, not following through. New satellite images reveal North Korea is expanding and continuing production at a missile facility, increasing fears that the rogue regime has no plans to pursue denuclearization. Joining us now, former CIA trained intelligence operative, former Navy pilot, Fox News correspondent Leah Gabriel. Leah, your response to this, your take on this report. Well, I don't think that it necessarily indicates that North Korea will not work with us on denuclearizing. I think that the bottom line is that, you know, the summit that occurred between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, they laid out sort of a groundwork agreement. They said we will work towards denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But you can't expect a country that believes that it's lifeblood, that believes that nuclear weapons, what it's expected to be able to protect it, um, as a nation, that they would just give up those nuclear weapons and they would stop progress in developing nuclear weapons off of one summit and one sort of loose agreement. I think that the president in conducting that summit, his intention was, let's start talking, let's start a conversation. Secretary Pompeo has testified on the Hill that we are aware that the North is continuing to work towards developing its nuclear weapons technology, but our diplomats are continuing to have conversations with North Korea to come up with a, a longer term agreement. So I think that's what our, our focus should be right now now is what progress can be made. And also, I think we just don't know what Kim Jong-un is thinking. Does he want to be brought into the fold of Western countries? Does he want to become a more modern country? Or does he want to remain in isolation? And we just don't know the answer to that yet, Dagan. Do you think that was a mistake, that it was a loose agreement, that there weren't specific details within the agreement at, that were made at the summit? Do you think we took a step back? I think it would have been great if we could have 100% gotten North Korea to agree to give up their entire nuclear weapons program that they've been developing for so many years. That would have been awesome of President Trump. But that's not what the president does. The president is an executive. He comes up with loose agreements. He brings countries together and has these conversations. And then he brings in the people who work for him, who are experts in the field to work out the details. That's how these agreements are done. So I don't think it was a mistake. I think he started a conversation. And the question is whether or not uh, North Korea is genuine in wanting to work with us and wanting to work with South Korea and wanting to become um, into the fold of, of you know, other nations. Le Leo, we, we gave up something in that negotiation. We gave up we these did. joint military exercises. Right. You know, with, with the North Koreans continuing to build, does that tell you that maybe we gave up too much because they really haven't moved besides giving back these remains. So first let me correct you because we didn't well, actually important. give up our, our, our exercises we decided to halt them, right? We can always turn those exercises back on. We've been doing them for a very long time with South Korea, and we work really well with South Korea, so we didn't give them up. But you were going to say... No, and he mentioned the return of the remains of those killed during the Korean War. Right. That, that is very significant, particularly the families and anybody who's ever served this country. Absolutely it is, and of course those remains, you know, I'm skeptical of them. In the past, you know, North Korea's been accused of throwing animal bones in those boxes, um, so those 
remains will be tested. Hopefully they'll be identified. But that is a very strong act of goodwill. And it's just a beginning. I mean, there are so many remains that are, that are there in uh, North Korea that families will want to get in there and, and have people be part of recovering. But that's a good point, that that was part of, of but, what's happened since the summit. Just, just to press on th this point about giving up the, the exercises, we can, we can renew them any time, but yeah. does it affect our preparedness if we're not doing them now? If you go a certain period of time without doing them, are you ready for some kind of military confrontation? And that's a great point. Of course, it affects your preparedness. You know, we saw how military preparedness was affected with sequestration and how it does damage our military and our ability to respond uh, immediately to threats if we're not doing exercises. That being said, uh, we can turn those back in a heartbeat. And President Trump knew that when he decided to halt them. But they've been a big aggravating factor for Kim Jong Un. He believes that they are um, that they are exercises to invade North Korea, which they are not. Uh, but it, it was basically to stop the aggravation. Hey, let's come together. Let's see what we can work out here. And now it's, it's down to the you know the smaller conversations um, that are that were not are not going to be as public among our diplomats. Um, and there is when you look at, at what's being done at this particular facility, Sanam Dong. Um, you know this is the facility where the longest range intercontinental ballistic missiles were developed, the ones that are believed to be able to strike the U.S. Although we we know as far as their technology is concerned, we don't believe that they have re-entry vehicles um, at this point uh, that, that can uh, bring that, that punch to the U.S. yet. Um, so there is, of course, concern about what we're seeing in these new images, but I don't think this is a surprise to our intelligence community. It's certainly not a surprise to Secretary Pompeo. Well, there are a number of stories that have come out. There was one that there, was, uh, there were images reportedly showing that North Korea was dismantling a key test site. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was an earlier report right after the summit that President Trump had that North Korea was continuing to enrich uranium. So there's a lot that's playing out in the press, yes. but we don't really know any much about the discussions that have gone on so far. And one of the critical things that General Jack Keane said on this program last week, that a key denominator will must be that North Korea hand over the location and identity and identify all the nuclear and ballistic missile test sites. And quite frankly, in the past, North Korea has wanted sanctions relief. Uh, they want the, the carrots and, and then delay, the, they want the carrots up front. And so if they're coming to us and wanting any kind of sanctions relief, then we should de we we should demand the location of all of these test sites and pr quite frankly maybe a time frame. And this is exactly why these types of negotiations are so difficult and can't be done in a single summit. I mean, it right. takes time to work through those issues. Uh, North Korea, as I said before, believes that North that its nuclear weapons technology is its lifeblood. It believes that it needs that to protect itself as a country. So we can't expect North Korea to just all of a sudden bend and fold. This is going to be a negotiations process. Do you think that President Trump is a little bit too optimistic when it comes to this? Because it is going to be a long process, and they have in the past promised things and then not followed through on those things. That would not be a big surprise. That's a great point. I think the question is, is President Trump really that optimistic, or is it what his public statements are versus what he's actually really thinking. Right. I think what he's trying to do is show goodwill mm -hmm. towards North Korea, and I think he's making public statements that do that. Uh, in my experience with diplomacy, there is public diplomacy and then there's private diplomacy. There's what you say you know, uh, behind the scenes, and then there's what you say publicly to encourage a country to work with you. And then the question is, is North Korea genuine? We don't know the answer to that. I will point out that he did tweet after that summit. And again, we talk about Twitter. It's his form of communication. There's no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. So yeah. I think people knew that, um, that that was, well, President Trump just being President Trump. Right. I want to um, read you this and get your reaction to it. The head of Iran's Strategic Council on Foreign Relations says that Tehran sees no value in Trump's offer for negotiations. This is actually the front page story in the Wall Street Journal today that President Trump is opening, open to median, meeting um, the leaders of Iran. I wanted to get your reaction to that. I think the react my reaction to that is just that Iran is essentially trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and use 
the same type of tactic that President Trump uses with countries against President Trump, taking this hardline approach. But in the past, we've seen this rhetoric fly. We've seen a lot of saber rattling. And then sometimes we see these offers to have a conversation work. So it's yet to, to be determined. But Iran has really been trying to spread its wings. It's been, it's been spreading its influence in the region. Iran has not been showing a desire to work with the U.S. and to, uh, to sort of settle back on some of its regional um, uh, its, its regional activities. Uh, when you look at places like Syria, you look at places like Iraq, um, Iran has, has been a really big problem. So it doesn't surprise me that they're reacting this way. Well, we want to one thing, that money talks and, uh, well, chit-chat walks, and we're yeah. getting ready to reimpose sanctions on Iran it's starting in August, mm -hmm. and we have essentially threatened to also put the hammer down on Europe, any European nations and, and countries and companies that do business with Iran. And so, of course, Russia is one of the ones that we have to be concerned with right. in working with Iran. Yeah, but he, President Trump did reiterate that there will be no sanctions relief on Russia, mm -hmm. and potentially more sanctions coming on mm -hmm. Russia. So, again, it's all about the moolah. It is about the money. And when you put pressure on a country economically, that's where we've seen them bend in the past yep. and fold. Uh, so it's it's to be determined how this is going to play out at this point. Leah Gabriel, thank you, Leah. Great to see you. You covered a lot of ground for us. Coming up, waging war on a wildfire. The car fire in Northern California now burning so hot, it's created its own weather system. We take you live to Redding, California for an update. Plus a touching moment amid the devastation. One little girl handing out burritos to firefighters battling that devastating blaze. We've got more of this heartwarming video for you next. The deadly California wildfire is still burning out of control. That fire so powerful, it's creating its own weather system, making containment all the more difficult for more than 12,000 firefighters. Our own Hillary Vaughn, live in Redding, California, to give us an update on the very latest. Good morning, Hillary. Good morning, Dagan. Over a dozen wildfires burning throughout the state. The car fire that tore through this Redding neighborhood has already killed six people. It's displaced thousands and it's also leveled entire communities. She's pointing to the ashes saying fire. So she knows they know what's going on. They just don't know how severe it is. And we're doing everything to keep them in that state of mind where they're happy and we're freaking out. I lost it all. Every bit of it. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> sorry. It's been a hell of a month for our firefighters. This fire has morphed into one of California's most destructive and deadly. Already in the top 10, the most damaging fires the state has ever seen. 16 states around the country have donated resources to help fight these fires in California. But even with the extra hands, firefighters are dealing with one of the most erratic fires that they have ever confronted, giving birth to a new phenomenon that even has some meteorologists curious. In Mendocino, a giant fire cloud ominously looming over a community that is struggling to stay standing. The giant cloud can trigger its own internal thunderstorm, creating its own weather, making it very unpredictable. And also here in Redding, a tornado of fire. Some are calling it a fire NATO, charging towards this town in a death spiral, whipping flames of fire at whirlwind speeds and destroying everything in its path. Now, firefighting efforts have ramped up to a small scale military operation. The California National Guard has deployed 800 uh, soldiers and airmen providing tactical backup on the ground and also Blackhawks and C-130s uh, tracking the fires from the air. And instead of carrying weapons, they're carrying tons and tons of fire retardant. Dagan. Hillary, thank you for that reporting. Hillary Vaughn there. It makes you realize how hard these firefighters work. Before somebody gets up in the morning and complains about their job, you better think about these men and women putting their lives at risk in California. And quite frankly, police officers, firefighters every day across this fine nation. And we want to show you this truly touching moment among all the devastation and destruction in Northern California. This video was posted to Facebook. It shows one little girl handing out burritos to firefighters battling the car fire. Watch this. Thank you. 
There you go. Just one act of kindness among many that have emerged in the wake of these fires. We love to see that. But that that's America. That's America. Coming up, money in the bank. Why millennials' preference for cash over stocks could cost them big time. That's next. A new Bankrate.com report shows that millennials prefer cash investments over the stock market. Meantime, unlike their younger counterparts, older Americans prefer the stock market as a long-term investment. Joining us now, the author of Retire Inspired and Ramsey Solutions financial expert, Chris Hogan. Why do you think millennials favor cash over the stock market, Chris? Dagan, I think it's because cash is real. It's something they can see, they can touch it. Uh, they understand how it works and where it goes. I think when dealing with the stock market, they don't understand it. And people tend to avoid and not use what they don't understand. Hey, Chris, it's Lindsay Bell here. Um, another thing that survey showed was that the interest in investing in homes and real estate has really dwindled among the millennial crowd. What do you make of that? I think for millennials, they want to be mobile. They don't want to be tied down. They're not ready to make that long-term commitment just yet. Uh, studies have shown they prefer experiences over items. So I think it's okay for them to rent. Renting is not necessarily a bad thing. It allows you to save up and buy a home when you're ready to settle down, start a family, or remain in an area for three to five years or more. Well, Kat Temp, maybe people of your generation and Lindsay's generation are risk averse for a reason, mm -hmm, because they exactly. saw home prices collapse during the, the the financial recession, depression back in 2008, and the stock market exactly. collapsed. So what's wrong with holding some cash, right. even though it's not earning you anything? Absolutely. It is difficult after you see those kinds of things throughout your life repeatedly to say, all right, yeah, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> Chris? Well, I think, you know, we definitely want to understand that having cash and saving is a good thing for an emergency fund. It's just not a good long-range plan. Uh, for example, the national average savings rate is 2%. So if you're parking a big chunk of money in a savings account and expecting growth, that's unrealistic. So savings is good, but investing is better. We need to be able to outpace inflation. So millennials need to understand this. Baby boomers need to understand this. Uh, looking at inflation hovering between 35 and 4%. If you're parking money in a savings account and getting 2%, it means your money is shrinking, not growing. What did, go ahead, John. I was, I was just going to say, I mean, there's an irony here because stocks tend to outperform cash and they outperform bonds in the long run. Millennials are younger than Gen X, which I'm in, or baby boomers. So they have time to ride out, you know, another decline in the stock market. So it makes sense to be in stocks if you're, if you're a younger investor. Chris, do you agree with that? I really do. I mean, especially if you look at and understand the stock market is like the supermarket. There are things that you can invest in that are good for you. There are things that you can invest in that are more risky. But it's like riding a roller coaster. When you're invested, there are going to be some ups and downs. But if you're investing the right way, your portfolio will be able to withstand it and even grow during those times. So investing is a long range approach. You have to think of it that way. And don't look and watch every little ticker symbol and all the little emblems and adjustments that happen. It'll cause you heartburn don't have heartburn and headache have a game plan long term work with an investing professional understand what you're investing in and get ready to win chris good to see you as always we agree today i'll find something we disagree about next time chris hogan i, I look forward to it <laughs> a financial hangover will tell you how much drunken online spending is costing americans every year and what you and why what you drink impacts how much you spend next